Okay, it's phone time. Ark of the Covenant, white powder of gold. I want to talk with Lawrence about that for a moment. And, of course, the shadow of Solomon. Where's the treasure? And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie with our guest, Lawrence Gardner. We're going to take your phone calls. Lawrence, let's talk a little bit more about this mystical white powder of gold. What kind of properties do you think it possessed? Well, the properties that that turned up really were learned about by accident onwards from the sort of 1980s when the, the test started to be done after it was newly discovered. And they emerged out of the research and the testing because nobody knew quite what it was. Um, it, it became impossible to test it, and they, they were trying spectroscopic analysis and neutron activation analysis and, and all sorts of things. And, and going through these processes, these, these various qualities start, and properties started to appear. Um, the first one of any, any major um, importance uh, seemed to be that its weight would fluctuate enormously. Um, this actually tied in with, with some ancient Alexandrian texts that talked about the powder in about 300 BC and, and explained exactly the same thing about it. They said it could be made to weigh far more than its quantity of gold or it would weigh less than a feather. And that's exactly what the scientists were, were discovering in the 1980s when they were testing it. So it had this <coughs> quality of, of, of weight change, which actually, in terms of it becoming lighter, it was, it was levitating. It, it began to levitate. And what they discovered was that, that, strangely enough, it was transferring its levitational quality to things that it touched. They, they discovered that the, the pan that they had the powder in, 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 in the lab when they were testing it would actually weigh um, more without the powder in it uh, at a certain temperature than it did with the powder in it. So the powder was sort of transferring this, this weightlessness to, to the host pan. That, that was one of the qualities. What actually happened um, in another test when they took its temperature up to an enormously um, high, high level, the stuff disappeared altogether. I mean, it just vanished into, into thin air. It, it disappeared. And um, so they figured, well, that, you know, it's clearly got the, the ability to become invisible. And um, they tested the invisibility of it by a very simple process. If, if something is in front of you and it's there one minute and it becomes invisible the next, that simply means that it's still there, but you can't see it. So um, <clears throat> given that it was powder in a pan, what they did, they got a spatula and they sort of messed it up where it was and, and figured, well, wh when it comes back into vision, when we reduce the temperature, when we bring it all back, it should come back in a messed up state. But it didn't. It, it came back exactly like it was before it disappeared, before it was messed up. And from that, they learned that it actually had the ability to move into another space-time dimension. So that was another quality of it. Um, various tests were done in the medical field. There's one particular article in um, American Scientist where they, they actually took two, two, two grains, two, two atoms of, of, of monatomic um, ruthenium, it was actually, not gold. It was ruthenium, one of the platinum group metals in mm -hmm. exactly the same state. And they just attached one of these atoms to each end of a DNA strand, human DNA. And the article is quite remarkable. They said that they, they, they thought that perhaps it would, it would increase the um, electronic capacity of, of the DNA because DNA communicates with itself through light waves, apparently. And what happened was that it multiplied um, this ability of DNA by 10,000 times, which was, was quite incredible. What, what they discovered from that was that it had a frequency, a light wave frequency, that was exactly the same as human DNA. And um, so they began to figure it could move into medical use. Um, I mean, all, all the way through this, certain, certain advantages were being seen. You know, it could be perhaps used for fuel cells. It was super conductive, um, which, which meant that it could transmit energy from itself to another version of itself somewhere else. 
um, whereas electricity needs wires and contacts to transmit energy. Superconductors of this sort don't. They can simply pass energy between themselves with, with no contact at all. So it became clearly a, an advantage in, in that respect. Um, fuel cells, clean energy, that sort of thing. Uh, what surprised me, in fact, it was, it was just a little after I'd published um, Lost Secrets of the Sacred Art, which, which came out in March 2003, was that I, I'd been talking about all, all of this, this stuff. And, um, you know, th 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 there was a fair bit of stuff to back it all up, but, but actually nothing had hit the mainstream. And, and suddenly, two months afterwards, it was in May 2003, um, suddenly it was there, and I managed to get the entry into the reprints of the book, but it wasn't in the first edition, and it, it happened in the Equity Gold Trust report, the prospectus that came out of the Securities and Exchange Commission in Washington, D.C. in that huh. month, in, in May, and what it says was that um, it, was, it was trying to encourage investment in gold. This was the object of, of the thing, uh, and what it said, that the future uses of gold will be in clean energy provision, Fuel cells, environmentally friendly, oh, sorry, environmentally friendly fuel cells, um, clean energy provision, and cancer treatment. And isn't it also interesting that <clears throat> Zechariah Sitchin wrote that when the Anunnaki came here and needed gold, they needed to shoot particles of it up into their own atmosphere to kind of preserve it. I yeah. I found that to be fascinating. Let's take yeah, a I mean, it, it all starts there. In, in, in fact, you know, what... Once you get hooked into this and keep going back, the further back you go, you keep finding talk about this gold and, and about its various uses. And, uh, I mean, way back in the, the, the times that Zachariah Sitchin writes about, and I, I did in, in, in one of my books, you, you get back to a period. I mean, write, writing really wasn't around forever, so we, we can't go back beyond a certain stage. But writings from about 2,500, 3,000 B.C., talk about this powder, which they call shemana. Now, shemana, which may be where the Hebrew word mana comes mana, from anyway, right, right. actually means highwood firestone in ancient Mesopotamian, highwood firestone. And it, it's kind of interesting because w when you come down to, to Renaissance times, when you get to the Royal Society uh, and the use of it, uh, uh, the name again, mana, they refer all the time to it being the same as the Philosopher's Stone, which was called a stone because it resisted fire like a stone. And this is exactly what the Mesopotamian text said 3,000 years before about the same stuff. Um, and, and, and so it, it, it seems odd. And, and when we get to Freemasonry and, and how the secrets were lost, this was known about in 3000 B.C., Maybe earlier, but certainly then, in the time of Moses, in the time of King Solomon, in the, in the time of Herod and Jesus, by the Templars, by the Royal Society, and then suddenly it gets lost, and we rediscover it in 1976. To some of the phones we go, we'll go to our international line. Where are you calling from? You're on the air with us. Yeah, good evening, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Sean in Victoria, British Columbia. Okay, Sean. Thank you. Uh, my great-grandfather was a big gun with the Masons about 110 years ago. And mm -hmm. I've done quite a bit of research, and I got a little couple of tidbits to throw at your guest to see what he has to say about it. Sure. But, I, but I do believe that there's a heavy influence or infiltration of the Illuminati. I know that the Queen is a big player with the Masonic Order in England, and also there's a heavy uh, uh, pharaonic or, or pharaoh influence overlapping through the uh, stories in the Bible and the... Um, the representation in the order. I know your guest wouldn't speak of much if he was in the upper echelon. And further to that, the queen was coronated on a step pyramid with a stone from the Middle East that still sits under her throne, and she has pharaonic uh, items, uh, the, the, um, the large staff that she has, and the whip that's sort of sewn into her braids under her arm, as well as the bee and the beehive on her um, inaugural, or whatever you want to call it, um, wardrobe. So um, that being said, I do think there's a heavy influence out there. Uh, I think that they're sort of farming through the Masonic Order people that they can utilize. And if you're looking for science and technology and the architectural um, engineers of the day knew all the secrets that were beholding to their kings and princes when it came to 
designing uh, secret passageways and escape routes and tunnels and vaults and mm. all those secretive uh, underground layers. So it was very convenient for these dark orders to uh, culminate together and to uh, basically uh, uh, pick who was pliable, who was um, uh, maneuverable, and who would uh, take the oath uh, to their death. And I, I, I just want to get your uh, guest thoughts on that. Okay. Thank you for Thank your time. You. Thank you. Go ahead, Lawrence. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't disagree overall w- with that. You know, when, when you say that um, people are brought in who might be manipulable or might be useful, I mean, that, that's exactly correct, I suppose. I mean, just the same way that I was brought in. You know, one, one can't decide to become a Freemason. You know, one has to be um, invited, and, and then it has to be sort of seconded, and the nominee has, uh, has to put you through tests and things. So it, it is in, in its own way selective, and it doesn't bring people in for no reason. It brings in people who, who might be of some use in some way. I mean, I never quite found out what my use was particularly. I was pretty good at making speeches, and that seemed to suit everybody. Um, the pharaonic um, influence, yes, it, it's certainly there. You know, what one can find a lot of influences within Freemasonry that go back to the mystery schools of ancient Egypt um, in connection with the white powder, for example. Um, uh, there was in about 1450 BC, in the time of uh, Pharaoh Tutmosis, uh, the fourth, um, he, he established what became known as a mystery school at Karnak, um, in the temple there, 39 high priests were on this council, and they became known as the Great White Brotherhood. And it was kind of Masonic in its own way because it was sort of secretive and it was involved in scientific things. The temple was a workshop. And um, it was the Alexandrians who, who, some years later, when they were writing about this Great White Brotherhood, actually said that they were called the Great White Brotherhood because of their preoccupation with a mysterious white powder. So we come back to that again. So this this flows all the way through. So yes, of course there are secrets. Yes, of course people are brought in who might be useful in some way or other. And I suspect that that was exactly the case in terms of the Royal Society and the way that that was formed and the way that people were invited to become scientists within its walls. Uh, The same is true today within Freemasonry. People are invited in because they can be useful, maybe because they got money to add to a charitable institution or because they're people of influence with with rich rich friends around them and that sort of thing. It's just that that what it's about today is is that it's about something different to what it was 300 years ago. So once you've got that straight, although the, the, the... reason for it is different. The nature of it is, is clearly very much the same. Um, and the only thing I disagree with you on is, is, is the fact that the stone in the Queen's, um, the Queen's, un, under the Queen's chair, that this was actually the, the, the coronation stone at Westminster, um, which is currently actually, it's not under the chair, no, it's up in Scotland, uh, Edinburgh Castle. And it, it came from Scotland in the first place, It was reckoned to be, and we don't know this for for truth, but it was always reckoned historically to be the stone um, uh, that the kings of Judah and Israel were anointed on in biblical times. And it was brought over uh, to Ireland, it then went to Scotland, and then it came down to England, and now it's gone back to Scotland again. Um, so, So that's where the history of that was. So in theory, and I say theory because... We're not really sure, but it's it, it, the stone that was beneath the Queen's chair might have perhaps been the same stone that Solomon was anointed on. All right, let's go to our wild card line. You're on with Lawrence Gardner. Hi there. Hmm. Hey, Bill. Hi, how are, you, how are you guys doing today? Good. Hi there. Go ahead. Uh, I, I was just wondering if you know of any similarities or connections with organizations like uh, the Knights of Columbus, and I'll tell you why. I'll explain why I'm, I'm asking that. Uh, over the past few weeks now, there's been uh, a publication on the Internet uh, saying how uh, the Knights of Columbus is now a, a big secret organization. And uh, I, I guess it's, it's the unknown that people don't know. Uh, and, and like I said, I, I was just wondering if 
if there is like any connection or or anything like that with say the Knights of Columbus. Okay, do you see that uh, as a secret society at all, Lawrence? The uh, Knights of Columbus, which is a Catholic organization, right? That's right. I mean, it's it's, it's a very Christian organization. Um, there's no real connection between it and and Freemasonry. I mean, it's a very different thing in as much as that it begins by being Catholic, whereas Freemasonry is not a. Re- I mean, it's not a religion as such. Freemasonry won't. The the premise is that when one goes into Freemasonry, uh, one is supposedly um, assumed to believe in a god, but that's about as far as it goes. You can be a Christian or a Muslim or, or whatever. Uh, the only the only branch of, of, of Christianity that doesn't like its people in, in Freemasonry are the Roman Catholic Church. And the reason for that is very simple. It's, it's simply because it regards Freemasonry as an organization that has secrets. And of course, Catholics aren't supposed to have secrets. They're meant to confess and, and that sort of thing. So it doesn't like it, but it doesn't mean that there aren't any Catholics in there. There are. Uh, the, the Knights of, of Columbus is... It's 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 a, it's fraternal in in the same way. I mean, they're not really knights. Um, it's, it's, it's it's run on chivalric ceremonial basis. Um, so it's kind of knightly. Um, it it's charitable. I mean, it, it does the work that it does. But there, there's no real direct connection with Freemasonry there. Okay, Lawrence, where do we uh, get this book, The Shadow of Solomon? Here in the United States, on oh, Amazon.com? Um, it can be got from Amazon.com, it can be got from Barnes & Noble online, or it can be got from, I guess, whatever shop stock my books over there. So can people eat uh, these, uh, you know, powder, the white powder? I mean, why doesn't it come out in tablet form? Use it as supplements. Well, I mean, there, there are um, a, a number of companies now um Particularly in America, actually. I mean, I, I don't know of any anywhere else, but there there are a number of companies on my website that are um, selling products which are various forms of, of white powder gold. I mean, some of them are actually white powder gold. Um, others are monosomic elements of the same sort that come from natural sources, deep seabed sediments, Arctic ice, this sort of thing, because th- th- these elements are everywhere. I mean, they're, they're, you don't just make them out of gold. They're, they're natural. That was how they were found in the first place in, in the 1970s. They, they turned up in a natural environment, and testing proves them to be what they were. Uh, but, yes, I mean, one can buy um, products um, online and... Um, I mean, I, I, I know plenty of people who, who have bought them and, and, and used them uh, quite what, – what, I mean, the, the, the point with it is that, that what one is buying is, is, is essentially a product, but it's not necessarily a product in a super high-spin state that is going to be levitational and, and all of those things. You know, one needs to put the thing through thermo gravimetric meters and things to, to, to take it to those states. All right, stay with us, Lawrence. We're going to come right back with final calls on Coast to Coast AM. Well, I want to thank all of you who joined up uh, for the free Streamlink weekend that we had about a week and a half ago. I mean, thousands of people uh, experimented with Streamlink, and uh, I think a pretty uh, good sum of you signed up for Streamlink, which is uh, great. If you need more information on Streamlink, just go to the coasttocoastam.com website. Where has the time gone, Mr. Gardner? As always, it flies, doesn't it, George? It sure does. Let's take some final calls here. East of the Rockies, Joe, you're on the air with us. Hi there. Good morning. Uh, I would like to, first of all, my feeling is is that the Ark of the Covenant is a book with gold on, or that is uh, written in gold. Secondly, with prophecy. And secondly, I would like to bring you to Toronto, where if you walk up the stairs of Old City Hall on the left-hand side, you'll see Stuart and Watson. And as being the oldest son, it's my great grandfather and my great great uncle, mm-hmm. and I'm the, uh, related to the Bells, Watsons, and Stewarts. And I'm trying to get the tour guys to stop calling them Templars. I'm trying to get the province to take notice of them because we're coming up to the War of 1812. We want to, uh, you know, develop our culture here and tell people who we really are. And that, uh, you know, I was raised Roman Catholic myself. But, um, you know, it's a great interest to me as carrying the bloodline. And, you know, I would like to, you know, to um, for people to take notice of it. 
and to realize that they're not evil people and they're not Templars. Well, I think you'd agree with that, Lawrence, would you I not? I think I would, yes. Yeah, yeah. All right, good. Hey, thanks for the call. Next up, let's go west of the Rockies. You're on Coast to Coast with us. Hi there. Hello. Yeah, welcome to the show. Yeah, my name is Lad in San Diego. Okay, Lad. Uh, I've been a uh, fan of uh, Lawrence Gardner for some time since I read his book, uh, Lost Secrets. Anyway, uh, I've been a motor rewinder in my own motor rewinding shop uh, since the 60s. I'm in my late 50s now, and uh, I'm quite the electrical scientist, and uh, I have built a modern-day version of the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> really? And uh, I'd like to know, sir, do you have any warnings for me? Because I have yet to fire it up yet. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Lawrence. What do you think? Save him. Well, let, let, I, I don't have any warnings. I, what, what does seem to be the case... Um, is that the what what one has to take account of apparently are the proportions. Uh, there have been many attempts to build uh, replicas uh, of the Ark, and in terms of it um, being used electronically, some have been very successful. Uh, but the proportions, I mean, I, I gave you these measurements early on, which were, were sort of approximated, but the, the actual dimensions are given in the Bible and also in, in Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark. It, it appears that there is... Um, an importance to the dimensions. Now, it doesn't really seem to matter whether you make it 10 feet long, 4 feet long, or 6 inches long. The proportions of the size have to be correct in ratio to each other. So that's, that's point one. If you've built your replica, I hope that's what you've done. Um, uh, what I've done is, is uh, I have a, a dialing device that is much like a diathermy electric machine yeah. in order to produce the white threads of electricity. Right. I, my goal is to produce negative charge monoatomic coal. So you're getting it to arc, are you? I, uh, I've done it with uh, some copper just to yeah. it out. But, uh, and, and I haven't used it for anything. I, I, I might try using it on some of my staghorn ferns or something as a plant food supplement. But uh, I'd just like to know, did you have any warnings? Uh, the ancients used to use DC power. Uh, I'm capable of doing it in both uh, t uh, types of electricity. Hmm. I was just wondering if you uh, had any recommendations, uh, because I have yet to fire it up yet and uh, make the actual negative charge monoatomical. Yeah. So no, I, I don't think so. I mean, it, it will basically what you've done, you've created a, an arcing device, you've created a capacitor, it will conform or should conform to all the, the rules of capacitor electronics. What seemed to be different about the biblical model, and I say seemed again because we, we, we don't know. We can only go what we're told was the case. But the ark seemed to change from the moment that Moses was said to take the manna and put it in the ark. So what, what we have is a situation where the white powder has been made from the gold. It is, let's presume, in a superconductive state. Um, it's placed within this electronic capacitor, and from that moment on, we have the stories about the arc levitating and whatever. So the arc has become something else now. Uh, the combination of the two things has changed it from being just a capacitor in, into being a piece of technology which is immeasurably different. Uh, and, and somehow or other, I don't know how, I've not done it, but somehow or other that gave it ama amazing powers of destruction. Um, what has been um, ascertained from the um, test back in the 1980s was that the white powder itself can be extremely destructive. Um, I mean, what, what one has to consider one particular set of experiments where, where they, they were using tungsten um, electrodes to test it, and, and the thing was just blowing these electrodes apart. They were costing four and five thousand dollars a piece, and it was just blowing them to bits. And in one experiment, it, it half demolished a, 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 a whole lab. Um, electronic points fizzed, and wires melted, and glass and porcelain shattered all over the place. So it was producing some sort of a ray. Now I don't know what that was—a gamma ray or, or something of that sort—but it was clearly very nasty. But that seemed to be more to do with the powder than the than the arc. You know, the arc itself should, in its in its basic form, be nothing more than a than a capacitor, and its size will determine its power. 
Okay, very good. Let's go to our wild card line. Leo, you're on the air with us. Hi there. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Leo. Hey, um, uh, the story about the covenant uh, piqued my interest because about, I'm, not, I'm really not sure, uh, probably about 20 years ago, uh, there was a story out of um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, of a group of MIT students mm-hmm. that reconstructed the Ark, yeah. uh, according to the biblical, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, what do I want to say? The uh, the size exactly, yeah. and they used gold to do yeah. this. And uh, there were there were people getting zapped. And I, mm. I I don't know if you folks ever heard of this. I I didn't. I mean, it, it's if if it's made correctly and and it works, then yes, you could get zapped with it. Um, yeah. I understand a few years ago, I heard that they were making a, a gold replica at Princeton University, but I never heard any more about it. Yeah, well, um, that, I mean, at, the interesting MIT. thing... MIT. MIT, yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, the Bible explains that those who were in charge of the Ark had to wear special clothing. They had to um, have gold chains hanging on their leather aprons, trailing on the floor to earth them. They couldn't yes. wear any shoes. I mean, all sorts of things. And anybody well, who, I, was, in, anybody who wasn't hear. dressed like they, that would be zapped by it if they got too close. Right. The, um, the authorities seized this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because uh, it was, they deemed it as a, a very. I, I just don't know if you if you could investigate that. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I haven't heard. I, I've never heard anything more about it, and no. I, it always intrigued me back then. And and the, listening to your show tonight, it was just like wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it should work. It should be able to um, to store and, they, they did store and generate about- electricity. It, you know what they did mention? And one thing I did catch from the story back then, it must have been about 20 years ago, but what I did catch, it was something about beta and gamma rays. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't really, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I don't see how an electronic device on its own could produce gamma rays. Um, but certainly, it, it would produce very powerful electronic electric charges. I mean, there, there's no doubt of that. And again, the storage capacity of it, which would depend on its size and various other things, would would determine the power um, of of that. Uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, I suppose, was an example on, uh, in film version, where they gave us a sort of an idea of the sort of thing that a machine of that sort could do. If you remember, it was zapping everybody in sight and melting them. Well, it was probably a bit over the top, um, but, but there's no doubt a device of that sort w- w- would be able to, um, to, to store and, and generate and produce uh, and emit quite powerful electronic charges. All right, next up, let's go to our wild card line. Kevin, you're on the air with us. Hi there. Hello. Yeah. Hello. All right, um, it was well known that Solomon was as Moses, he was a magus, and that he was well-renowned, yeah. especially in the art of controlling demonic spirits, especially mm-hmm. they were named the 72. Well, according to legend, and especially it's in Kings 2, God punished Solomon for burning incense and building monuments to foreign gods, yeah, yeah. and he believed that this was brought about by one of these 72 that he had lost dominion over. So in an attempt to glorify himself and, you know, right his wrong, he sealed the 72 in a brass cauldron and threw it into the sea. Now, this eventually washed ashore, and people found it, hoping that they would open it to find treasure or uh, bottled genies, which wasn't the case. When they opened it up, the 72 released, and uh, more, more angry than ever, they are still on the loose today. I was wondering if maybe the true treasure of Solomon, the only way to control these spirits, was by the ways uh, written in his book, the Clavicus Solomonis. I wanted to know if maybe his true treasure was this knowledge of how to control these spirits since they had been released. I don't know. As I said earlier, there's a lot written about Solomon. You know, if one reads 
Jewish philosophical literature, Talmud, Midrash, the, the, these sort of works. There's a lot in there about King Solomon that isn't in the Bible. And you know, one never knows where the, the sources were for this information, but it goes back a long, long way, in the sort of second, third, fourth century when these sort of writings began. They talk about the fact that, um, yes, you, as you say, that there were sort of demonic spirits um, that, that Solomon was, was in some sort of collusion with, and one of them, Asmodeus, actually was supposedly the guy that helped him to build the temple. Um, now, one never really knows whether this is pure myth, pure legend. Um, what I've learned about most legends is that it has some sort of foundation, in fact. You know, it doesn't generally start off with being totally and absolutely made up. Um, but I, I've not heard of this story of the bottle, you know, the, the, the sort of sealing up the, the 72. I haven't heard that one, I must admit. Okay, next up, let's go to our first-time caller line. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, my question is about, I read a book uh, probably 15 years ago called The Sign in the Seal by Graham Hancock, who's uh -huh. been a frequent guest on the show. Oh, sure, absolutely. And he put forth the theory of, of the Ark, or he investigated the fact that the Ark of the Covenant might be in Ethiopia. That's right. My question is, you stated earlier that there wasn't any historical evidence uh, for that, but uh, how do you explain the traditions of the Ethiopian priest and their belief that they do have the true Ark of the Covenant there in that country? Well, the, the, the story began to circulate from England when it was translated in the 1800s, but it, it began in the 1300s when uh, a totally anonymous book appeared in Ethiopic called the Kebran Nagast, Glory of the Kings. And it was that time um, when Europe was infiltrating into African countries, and, and the object of this book, Kebran Nagast, was to establish the pretense of a long-standing Judeo-Christian culture in old Ethiopia, Abyssinia, as it was called then. And, and it claimed that the kings of the country had descended from a certain Menelik, who was a, a son of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Not that that's biblical, but this is what it maintained, and, and that Menelik had brought the ark with the commandments into Ethiopia, having secreted them out of the temple in the time of King Solomon. Now, that conflicts with, with Jewish law and with the Bible and everything else, which says that the ark remained there king after king after king after king. Um, the interesting thing about the, the situation today, uh, and Graham makes this point in his book, of course, is that the ark is supposedly kept now in a building in in Aksum in Ethiopia. It, it, it was actually, it, the building wasn't erected until the 1960s. It's a chapel that is pretty crude, actually. But nobody, not the doorkeepers, not even the patriarch of the country, has ever seen this ark. It's, it's kept locked up there, and they say that they have it, and they guard it, but nobody's ever seen it. Now, one day a year, it is supposedly um, carried through the town and it's draped in a cloth. But actually, the, the, the object, whatever it is that is carried through the town and draped in a cloth, is simply a flat piece of something. It might be wood, it might be stone, whatever it is, it's just flat. It's not a, not a box or a casket of any sort at all. So whether that is what they think they're guarding or something completely different, who knows? But um, the, the intriguing thing is that the, the legend has been perpetuated since the 1300s, We've made quite a lot of it in the West since the 1800s, and it's the biggest tourist attraction in the whole of that part of Africa. So um, it's, it's a pretty good idea for them to carry on with the myth. Okay, let's go to a, one or two more calls, and that'll be it, Lawrence. Wildcard line. Hi there. Sabrina. Hello. Hi. Um, Hello there. I was just curious if, um, if women are allowed in the... Uh, in the um, the Freemasons. Mm -hmm. Are they allow women in uh, okay. Freemasonry? Yes. Um, some, some lodges do. Uh, in, in essence, it, it, it's a male-only institution. Um, but back in the uh, 1700s, they introduced um, some women's lodges in France. You've actually got some over there in America. I can't think what they're called, but there's two or three that I did know of that are lodges that, that women can 
Uh, enter. There's one here in Britain that I know of that I, I believe actually our ex-Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher belonged to, I think. I don't know for sure. The, the story was said that she did. Um, but yes, the, the, there aren't, as far as I know, any mixed lodges. Um, but there are certain lodges that women can belong to. And as far as I understand it, they operate in very much the same way that the, the men's lodges do. Uh, but they're very much in the minority. Lawrence, what are you working on next then? When uh, does the next work come out? Oh, goodness knows, George. I don't know when it will come out. I'm working on all sorts of things at the moment. I, 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 I generally, what, what happens is that from book to book, and it began right back at the beginning with Bloodline, that whenever I write a next book, it's generally an answer to the most asked questions that I get from the previous book. So I sort of rely on my readers and, and phone-ins of this sort to, to get the information of where people want me to head next. When can we expect um, you next in the United States, sir? I don't know. I haven't been over there for, for some time. In, in actual fact, it's been a very good reason. I had some quite nasty facial surgery a, a year or two ago, and um, it, it sort of put me out of the public limelight for a while. Oh I, I was sort of looking like a phantom of the opera for quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped doing television and... and um, just did radio, uh, and, huh? Yeah, you had a face yeah, for radio. Yeah, I was for radio, but uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't much good to look at. And I, I'm sort of getting better now, so I, I hope to be over there before Well, keep, too long. keep in touch with us, Lawrence. I all right, indeed, George. All right, my friend, Lawrence Gardner. This recent book, The Shadow of Solomon. Stay with us tomorrow night because we've got a special program in store for you as well. That'll wrap up tonight's program for Steve Carr, Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Gina Yates, Lex Lonehood, Sean LaDessour, Ross Mitchell. Ian Punnett, Art Bell, I'm George Norrie. Somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM, we'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.